compassion encircles the earth for all beings everywhere. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome the to the show. The true genius. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's Madeline Tuttle. Dr. Will Tuttle's wife, Will, welcome to the show. Thank you, Philip. Great to be and here. And you've been on a couple times, and <clears throat> we've, we've covered some, some ground as it relates to veganism. We even talked about civil liberties as in the, in the age of, of, of a, a so-called um, health pandemic and the government's reaction to that with lockdowns and restricting of freedom. And we want to talk maybe even further extend and talk maybe get into the spiritual aspects and specifically Zen, right. Zen Buddhism, which I've been migrating toward those, uh, those uh, ideals and understandings and spiritual, spiritual way. And um, I, I, for my own self, indulge the conversation a little bit for me is that I don't feel that, I feel like it's a snap on like a piece of Lego, like a Lego piece to my own um, faith tradition, which is Greek Orthodox Christian, right? And I don't think that they uh, now. I'm, I think the priests in the black suit and the white collar would probably really uh, disagree with me and try to save my soul to get away from uh, any other type of faith disciplines and spiritual disciplines. But you know, in in my book, chapter nine, as you know, in Peru, I participated in an ayahuasca ceremony where uh, I was actually. It revealed the uh, you know the 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 spirit of creation and it, it um, these 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 labels and the Christianity was all just layers of a costume that made up myself and yourself and and this idea of the community and the culture. I mean, we live in the culture and the culture lives in us, and so it is. And here we are in this mm-hmm. age, like I said, in the middle of this corona, coronavirus. Um, pandemic health health uh, health uh, emergency and so how do we as we're living in this current situation how do we then uh, reconcile that or how do we actually keep sane how do we then you know buttress ourselves and our own individual selves how do we provide how does Zen Buddhism provide a bulwark let's say and then even Zen Buddhism in the truest sense is is vegan is that right I think we yeah. can agree on that. So how does this Zen Buddhism, which, you know, is foundational, is a plant-based way of living, how does this Zen Buddhism actually help us keep sane in the middle of all this? Yeah. Well, you know, thanks, Philip. I think the, the thing to understand is that Zen Buddhism, Zen is a, um, a branch of Buddhism, in a sense, or, or a, one of the main schools in Buddhism. Zen, the word Zen actually comes from the old uh, word in Sanskrit, dhyana, which means meditation. Dhyana, and so that's basically a, a consciousness or a mind that's in the present moment, that's open and relaxed and awake and aware. And so the word dhyana, uh, when it went to China, they tried to say dhyana, but all they could say was chana. Then they shortened it to chan, and then when it went to Japan, they couldn't say chan. All they could do was say zen. So the word zen actually is hmm. the word dhyana which means meditation, and it's a blending, really, of the Buddhist teaching from India with the indigenous teaching from China of Taoism. And Taoism and Buddhism share a lot of similar teachings. The harmony with nature is a really important one, but Buddhism brings in this sense of ahimsa, which is what we were talking about with veganism. Ahimsa is the old Sanskrit word that means non-harmfulness, non-violence. And so like in Buddhism, there's the five precepts, which is foundational to the meditation practice. So the idea is that we can meditate every day, which is what Zen is really all about, is a daily meditation practice where we take time to bring our mind into this moment and listen internally to connect more deeply with our true nature and to ask more and more deeply, what am I or who am I? Not that I'm just this body and the collection of memories and mind, all that surface stuff, a name and a form and so forth that we attach with, but the infinite and eternal consciousness which enlivens this. But we'll never get anywhere in this practice of meditation if we're not practicing the five precepts. So the five precepts are not to kill, not to steal, not to lie, lie, not to sexually abuse, and not to use liquors or drugs or cause others to use liquors or drugs which are harmful. 
So it's important, again, that's why it's vegan, is because animals that are used for food, we kill them, we steal from them, we lie to them, we sexually abuse them, and we force you know, 10,000 different drugs and hormones and antibiotics onto them without their permission. So we're breaking the precepts, we're harming and abusing them on a massive scale, and then we eat all that stuff. We eat all the toxins, we eat the misery, the terror, the fear, the pain. So the whole idea in Buddhism, essentially, is to practice kindness and compassion for other living beings. And that's referred to as the bodhisattva ideal. And the bodhisattva ideal uh, really is to live our lives in a, as a, in a, as a uh, statement of blessing others. And the whole idea is to live as best we can to be a blessing to others. As soon as I live my life uh, to just help myself at the expense of others, I'm, going to, I'm sowing seeds of misery for myself and for others. And as soon as I live my life as best I can to bless others in some way to, to help, help make their lives better, I'm sowing seeds of happiness for myself and for others because the idea is that th this life is very brief. We're here for a few decades and that's it. And mm -hmm. it's not us. I mean, this physical body is not us. We're the consciousness that is projecting through this physical body. But this consciousness is eternal and will manifest in countless lifetimes. And so the whole idea is to learn and to grow and to awaken. So whatever's happening on this earth plane when we're here, it's, it's fuel for learning. It's grist for the mill. You know, it's, it's something. So we, we're like in this thrown into right now into this really stress, stressful situation of a pandemic. And a lot of people are just, how do I, how do I find peace and harmony in the middle of this stress of this pandemic? And I think... Uh, your question is great because it's, when we look from the point of view of Zen and the Bodhisattva ideal, we see that the only way forward really is to question the official narrative in our society that reduces animals to just matter and reduces us to just matter. That I'm just this body that has to survive and compete against others. There's not enough food, there's not enough water, not enough money, I've got to get enough for myself. And we're kind of using each other as instruments to get what we want, keep away what we don't want. And that whole thing, that's called samsara in the Buddhist tradition, which means suffering that never ends. Because we'll bring that into the next life, and if we don't learn in that one, we'll bring it into the next one, and we'll always find ourselves, even if we're wealthy, we'll be afraid and we'll be, or if we're poor or whatever it is. So the idea is to awaken out of that. That's what's referred to as nirvana in a sense, or in the Zen tradition it's called kensho, which means awakening. You know, we can awaken out of this fundamental delusion of being a, uh, an essentially separate self. And that's the greatest gift we can give to the world because once that happens, then we begin to be a giver. We begin to just be here to be generous, to help others to help make the world a better place while we're here because we realize it's, it's very ironic. It's kind of like the, the way to be the most selfish is to be the most loving <laughs> because the more, the more loving and kind we are, actually the, the more our, our mind is at peace. And then when we go to meditate, to do the dhyana part, the meditation, then, then we're at peace with ourselves and our mind can go deep. If, if, I'm not, if I'm manipulating and using others and thinking how can I get better of them and so forth, then my mind's never going to be at peace. So all of this stuff fits together. And I think it's intimately connected with our, our physical health, our immune system too. And it's all interconnected with our society and with our relationships, actually. Well, you, actually, right. speaking of relationships, how do the personal relationships relate to the events that we're seeing in, a, in the outer world today? Yeah, that's, that's so interesting. And that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, we have personal relationships like if I'm eating a steak, you know, I have a personal relationship with a cow somewhere, right? I mean, you don't get more intimate with somebody than eating them. I mean, that's really intimate, like actually eating, killing and eating them. So we're having intimate relationships with animals if we're eating them. But we're also having relationships with everyone around us, right? I mean, we're, we're relating to people all the time, whether we see them or don't see them. If I buy food from uh, a farmer, I'm, I'm in a relationship with them. And I think the problem is in our society, we're, we're born and raised in a society based on animal agriculture, which is relationships essentially, unfortunately, of oppression and exploitation for the most part, where we're buying and selling in ways to uh, further the, the system of exploitation. So to do the best we can that our relationships are based on respect and inclusion. What veganism is really is the sort of radical inclusion of saying I'm going to do the best I can to include all beings in the sphere of my concern 
what, what, whatever I'm eating and whatever I'm saying to other people. So in the Buddhist tradition, we talk about actions of the body, speech, and mind. These are the three uh, powers that we have. We, we're thinking. So we're, what kind of thoughts do we have? So we start there, and we, and we do the best we can through meditation and through pr- training that our thoughts are loving. The whole idea is like we're we walking down the street, we see somebody, we don't have to wave to them or anything. We can just silently send them a feeling of mm. love. How about if someone cuts you off in the yeah, in yeah. traffic? Yeah, right. Still loving. Yeah, so like, wow, they, they off, must be, you just they say, just might be having a bad day. Yeah, yeah, just send them a shot of love. You know, it's that and kind of idea. You actually yeah. told me a few years ago when you were a monk in, uh, in a Zen Buddhist, um, not a monastery. It was a monastery. It was a monastery, in right, Korea. in South yeah. Korea. Right, yeah. And as a treat, I mean, you were meditating how many hours oh, a day? Oh, yeah, like 12 hours a day. 12 hours a day yeah. and getting up at 3 in the morning. And, um, and uh, you know, but as a treat, the monastery would give the monks, uh, was it some kind of yeah, cupcake okay. or I'll brownie? Just quickly, yeah. yeah go ahead. There, there, was a, there was a foreign sangha. Like, there was, there was the regular, the sangha is the community. So there was this whole, whole Korean community. But then there was another community with some Koreans and then some Europeans and Americans like me. So we were in this one. And separate areas? A little You're bit separate. separate. We, were, we were together for the meals and a lot of things, but we would meditate in our own um, hall. And um, so every once in a while, not very often, maybe once every four weeks or something, um, some of the local, they're called Bosalim, the, the lay women, would, would take compassion on these poor Western monks in this monastery because we're just eating brown rice and, and vegetables. And, and they would give us a little cake because, you know, the people in the West like to have a cake, you know. <laughs> so, um, so as a so, treat. It's a treat. We would Very a once in a while. Every really once in a while. rarely. So one day, you know, all of a sudden, you know, they said, oh, everybody gets a cake. So, I, so everybody took their cake. Most of the monks I saw just ate theirs because it was like right after lunch in the afternoon. And I thought, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to eat it now. I'm not hungry. So I put it in my, I had my own private little locker. Little locker. Monks had a locker. So I put mine in my own private little locker. And then I came back, I think it was like later uh, in the evening, and I thought, oh, there'd be a good time you know, before the next meditation, I'll have my cake. And I opened up my little locker, and it was gone. <laughs> my cake was gone. <laughs> and it was cake so... Cake burglar. It was so funny, because you know, here you're in this monastery with all these monks, you know, everybody's like following all the precepts, and, every, and um, it sh- that should never happen. But, you know, but the interesting thing is I was working with this practice called the Four Baharas, which is to cultivate love, compassion, joy, and peace, and just radiate that out. And the joy uh, of those four, the whole idea is joy, not just that I got what I want, but joy in the joy of others. You know, this feeling of joy when someone else gets what they want, then you just feel a sense of joy with them. So, we don't, so it kind of cuts off that feeling of jealousy that we, humans very often feel. Which we know is a destructive emotion. It's terrible. So you see somebody else that's, that's really happy, you think, oh, I wish they weren't so happy because it reminds me that I'm not happy. You know, that, that kind of idea. So you feel joy. So, so you realized yeah. you, you were missing your cake. And then right. what was, I mean, you probably had a reflex reaction, but then what well, was your ultimate no, reaction? No, what happened, with the, no, it was actually the reflex because I was practicing this every day. So the instant mm-hmm. reflex. So you were already was, there. Yeah, in the reflex was, I just, in your development, I, saw, you yeah, I just saw this guy took it and I thought, did you know instantly, who took it? I have no idea okay. who took it. But I just thought, since I'm, whoever this guy was, it was like, wow, he had his. And then he had another one. That must have been so cool, you know, to eat one and then get another one on top you of it. You were happy for him. So I was like really happy. I was like, I couldn't have been more happy if I'd so eaten it myself. I have to I tell you, could have been. I, have to, I have to tell you, you have told me that story a couple times over the years. And so I took that story, it, that story is a personal inspiration for me. I don't know if I told you that. So, mm. but we have this joke in my family and I have a really bad habit. I leave my car, my car key in the car Wherever I go, <laughs> wherever I go, yeah, yeah, and it drives my dad crazy because my dad, my parents are from New York, and they have that mentality that everybody's trying to steal from them. They lock their their doors, they lock their windows. Everything's always secure. Right, right. So I tell my dad, you know, my dad oh, says right. you're gonna you're gonna have your car stolen because you go to the mall wherever you go and you leave your key in the car. I say, Dad, you know. I would be so happy for that person. They stole my car. <laughs> got that means car. they needed they needed that car more than I did. But then there was another another inspiration in my life is um, is Victorus Kolvinskis, and as you know, he is at this point basically blind. Mm-hmm. And um, I meet with him privately from time to time when he comes on campus at Hippocrates, and he told me a couple couple years ago he said about his blindness. He said, well. 
I'm so grateful because mm. now I know what it's like to be blind. Mm. And that, and then I thought back to you and your example of the mm. silly little cupcake, mm-hmm. which is, which is uh, actually very uh, teachable, uh, although it's just about a cake, right? <laughs> but, right. but uh, those two examples have been really inspirational for me. And uh, so, thank you for your life's work, the World Peace Diet. Hold up the book for us. Uh, it's available on Amazon in in many forms, including audio books, and it's about mm-hmm. twelve hours in your voice. And uh, mm-hmm. you give lectures about a half an hour, so you, you don't believe in, in uh, how do you say it, <laughs> in, in, in imposing unnecessary harm, harm on sentient beings. By making them sit yeah. still so for too long. You're not, right? We're not going to read that book for 12 hours. <laughs> right. My book is also on audiobooks. That was, I think I was, I'm a faster, I read faster than you. Your, your, your audio book is just like, it's a lullaby. You know, mm-hmm. your voice is very very silky and zen, and zen since we're using that term i'm a little bit on the faster side so my book is nine hours <laughs> um, but it's a right. few pages shorter actually so well that's going to be it today for today's episode of the traveling vegan where we talk about zen buddhism we talk about veganism we talk about our civil rights in the age of a worldwide health pandemic and thank you so much for watching and please share this video and the other videos on this channel with every anyone that you want to we're trying to get to the point where we get so popular that we get deplatformed so thank you very much for helping us in that effort